Hey guys, so today I'm going to be talking about the microbiome. So it's going to be a review of the interaction between microbes. Um, so I'm going to be briefly talking about fillers. So these are kind of like the introductory before I actually hit the main topic. So I'll try to keep this brief, but here we go. So refresher of me, I did a talk last year about plants within the uh, crab attack. But if not, I am Jay. I've been a crab since 2012. I'm Australian, but you didn't tell. <laughs> and I've actually completed now my double bachelor's students, um, biological science and science, and my interests include aquariums, plants, crabbing, and sciences, if you didn't tell. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping to kind of take you on a journey of the fun, fun and fascinating world of microbiology and give you a bit of info of how it heavily interrelates within our day-to-day -day crabbing that maybe you didn't even realize what's actually occurring. So as we view down the metaphorical microscope, I hope that, you know, we take you on this fabulous journey and give you some appreciation of what microbiology is all about. So as I uh, mentioned prior, my plant talk last year focused a lot on my personal opinions and also opinions shared by others. However, this year, that isn't really going to happen and there's going to be a lot of scientific jargon. Unfortunately, this is means that I can't avoid it and so that means I'm going to have to talk about it. Um, I'll try my best to kind of lead you on um, as I know that everyone comes from different levels um, of understanding with not only science but microbiology in itself. Um, just bear with me. <laughs> it's very hard when it's not live so I'll do the best I can <laughs> but I can't promise. And I know that Courtney did a bioactive talk a couple of years ago and I'm trying not to step on anyone's toes. However, if I do mention any topics that Courtney mentioned, then just consider it a good refresher. <laughs> so what are microorganisms? So microorganisms are basically anything that's living that is too small to be seen with the naked eye. So if you need a microscope, it's too small. Um, there are some exceptions. Like everything in biology, there's always exceptions. However, that is the general classification of a microorganism. So they are divided into kind of like five or six main groups. So you've got the bacteria, you've got the archaea, you've got the protozoa, you've got the algae, and then you've got the fungi. Um, and they are kind of all shown in this little tree of life. Uh, we're here with the animals. I will mention now that if I say an animal, I'm probably also referring to us too. Um, just a little heads up because I will do it. Um, some like to also include viruses and prions, however, the majority of scientists don't because they're non-living non -living entities, which is probably the correct way to say, um, as they require an organism to replicate and survive. So without them, they will not be there. So as a result, they do not consider them microorganisms. Some do, some don't, most don't. So generally, when someone says microorganism, it's safe to presume that they're meaning bacteria, archaea, fungi and protozoa, um, however, there might be some that just include the others, but those are the majors. So, little species spotlight. So, when I come up with a species spotlight, that means we're going to be talking about a new species. When I say species, I mean species because sometimes we might be talking about genus, sometimes we may be talking about family or order. Um, so, I will give the same species spotlight, even though it's not a species, just a little heads up. Um, to keep it consistent. <laughs> really. um, so there'll be a generalized overview, general facts, an outline on habit, where it's found, um, fun facts if I got any, and I will say that if I mispronounce any scientific names, I'm sorry. Um, when I say it by myself, I'm fine, but then when I have to say it to someone else, even if it's to a recording, I literally butcher it, so I'm sorry if I do. So first one, bacteria. So they're one of the first life forms on Earth and one of the most diverse. So little fun facts, and we're going to do a segue back to my plant talk. Plants roughly um, make up about 80% of the Earth's biomass. So biomass is like, you know, how much or weight. 80% of the Earth's biomass is plants. Um, and then, believe it or not, then the bacteria come up at number two at 15%. And you may be like, wow, Jared, that's really fascinating. Like, Cool. Um, when you come and think about how animals only make up about five-ish percent, five-ish, ten-ish percent, um, you really go, wow, um, something that's literally non-existent to my eye right now makes up 50% of the mass on Earth. If you got all the bacteria and put it together, it would be 15% of the mass of all biological 
that is. Um, so they're prokaryotic, and I'll be briefly explaining what they are. And they kind of split into two main types. So they're gram negative and gram positive, and I'll also be explaining what they are right now. So prokaryotes, what are they? So they basically do not contain a unit, uh, a nucleus. So their cell do not contain a nucleus, as seen here. That kind of you know squiggly part in the deep is the DNA, um, which leads to no specialised DNA compartment, which leads to really no organelles, um, except, for example, ribosomes. Uh, and they're very simplistic uh, compared to eukaryotes, uh, which I'll also be explaining further on what they are. They're unicellular, so it means they're only one. Um, so, you know, when you see one cell, it's one dude, like, you know, one me, one you, that's kind of the prokaryotes. So gram negative and gram positive. So these are kind of a bit of a diagram of what they are. So we're going to talk about the gram negative. So if you look, see there's two membranes, there's an outer and an inner, and then there's a really thin peptoglycan layer. And the reason why I'm mentioning the peptoglycan is because I'll be explaining of how they differentiate. Um, so the peptoglycan is going to be kind of important. Then you've got the gram positive, which has a really thick peptoglycan layer compared to just having one membrane so, um, cell membrane. Sorry. Uh, and that's how you can kind of differentiate. And the way that they do this is through a Gram stain. So Gram stain was in, uh, developed by Hans Christian Gram, and it was developed all the way in 1888, 1884, sorry, wow, um, and still used extensively in microbiology today. Um, so the way it's done is you first get the bacterial colony cell, put it on a plate, or on a slide, and then you stain it with crystal violet, and then you allow the crystal violet to sit for a couple of seconds, you wash that off, and then you put iodine on it. And the crystal violet is really, really like strongly binds to the peptoglycan, and the iodine helps also intensify that bonding. Um, and then comes along ethanol, so alcohol, and with alcohol, alcohol actually washes away crystal violet. So with a really thin membrane of the gram negative, gets rid of all the purple stuff. Well, the positive because it's got a really thick layer keeps all the purple or most of it and then you counter stain with something like sassafran so that is what gives it that beautiful pinkish reddish color of the gram negative um and that is how you differentiate between the two um in the process of the gram stain you can also look at you know the shape so for example the purple ones are round which is what they call cockeyed and then you've got the red ones here which is long and that is called the cilli, so rod shaped. Um, you can also look at how they grow as well. And as you can see, this is a mixed culture, but you can also look at an isolated culture too. So it can be really handy with preliminary identifying bacterial species. So the next one is archaea. So it comes from the Greek word, sorry if I put you this, archaeos, which means ancient or primitive because they are one of the oldest life forms on earth. Um, they're primitive in terms of the way that they um, they're not really primitive in terms of like how they are, if that makes sense. Um, they're prokaryotic. Um, some species are extremophile, so extremophile means they grow in extreme conditions for us. So, for example, think of high pH, low pH, high temperatures, low temperature, migrating places of heavy metal, um, extreme, extreme salt, uh, extreme chlorine. You name it, probably like, you know what's free real estate, let's grow there. They also, um, and the way that you differentiate from bacteria is because they have different proteins within its cell wall or membrane. Um, and so that's how you can kind of differentiate between the two. Otherwise, they basically look the same and they act very similar. A little fun fact, we're actually close in relation to archaea and bacteria. So the next one is protista. So these are kind of the misfits. So they are anything that isn't a plant, an animal, fungi, or bacteria, or archaea. And the reason why is because they're eukaryotic, which I'll explain in a bit more uh, in the next slide. So they're very incised, so they're usually very small, but you can get some pretty actually chunky boys. Um, and the smaller ones are usually unicellular, so they're in the bond compared to the big ones, which are usually multi multicellular, but that is not always the case. There's always exceptions. Uh, and then they're often found in wet areas, so think of ocean, lake, rivers, uh, wet soils, and they'll probably grow their you know, issues. So what are eukaryotes? So they basically do contain a nucleus this time. So see this here is the nucleus. So this is where the DNA is kept. And um, this leads to a lot of specialized organelles, as you can see all of these. So you've got things like the mitochondria, the house of the cell, and favorite. Then you've got the chloroplast, which is present in plants and algae. 
uh, which allows them to photosynthesize. You've got the endoplasmic reticulum, which leads to uh, ribosomal um, transfer and whatnot. You've got the Golgi, which leads to protein transfer, um, and things like that. Uh, they can be unicellular, multicellular. So think of us, we're multicellular and we're eukaryotic. Um, and then they can be as small as a protein, so single one, and they've got all these little things happening all together. Uh, the next one is viruses and prions. So viruses are an, are infect cellular organisms. Um, that is why they're not living because they actually require a cell to replicate. Without them, they cannot replicate. So think of like if you get the flu, the flu gets inside your immune cells, replicates, then comes out of it, however it wants to do it, and then infects other cells, so on and so forth, and kind of goes down the line. As soon as it has no cells, it can't infect. Uh, then the next is the prion. So there's a blue. So normally, um, think of proteins, it folds in a particular orientation. And for whatever reason, if it misfolds, like instead of folding like this, it folds like this, that may lead to aggregation, so buildup of protein. So, for example, a common disease in people is like the mad cow disease, which is actually a pyron buildup in the brain. Good fun fact. And another fun fact is that viruses that infect bacteria are called bacteriophages or phages. Um, so they're kind of a little subset of the virus. So what is important about microorganisms? So they're a food source. Without them, we would not be living because they are literally the starting chain of all organisms. Um, they put in um, ocean nutrient sequestration. So for example, a lot of carbon, uh, nitrogen, and um, sulfur storage. Um, so for example, we'll think of ocean acidification. So as the ocean gets acidified due to increased levels of carbon, uh, within the water, the bacteria actually helps store it away by locking it in the sand, um, which decreases carbon, which is kind of good for us. Uh, the next one is oxygen. Believe it or not, uh, microorganisms actually contribute more than what plants do, um, roughly about 50 to 80 percent, depending on who you're speaking to. Um, so, majority of oxygen that you breathe actually come from like algae and protista. So animal and plant health without microorganisms, we would not be healthy and happy and thriving because we actually have microorganisms occurring all over our bodies. Without microorganisms, we will not be happy and healthy. And another fun fact, bacteria can actually induce rain. So bacteria can help water kind of coagulate together. And when that happens, that leads to, you know, the water drop getting too big and falling, leading to rain. So bacteria can also help things with rain, which is pretty cool. So the topic breakdowns, these are going to be the topics that I'm going to be discussing. So there's going to be environmental microorganisms, so looking at potential species in the native ranges of the hermocrabs, as well as within crab captivity. Then looking at the crab itself, so looking outside on the exo, but also looking internal as well and looking at the microbiome. And then I'm also going to be giving a generalized introduction to hermocrab parasites and pathogens. So that's going to be pretty fun, hopefully. So. Now, the environment. So when I think of the environment, I think of like soil, I think of water, I think of plants, I think of animals. Um, you know, without microorganisms within the environment, we will not have what this pretty picture here with all these lush trees and plants and whatnot, because they help keep the earth going round, pretty much. Um, so many species have certain niches that it occupies, so they can only be found in certain areas. And in particular, the soil microbiome plays a critical role in nutrient cycling. So there's one of the highest concentrations of microorganisms within you know, the world when comparing different habitats. Um, the soil microorganisms can be uh, grouped into six main ordering groups. So you've got the bacteria, you've got the encinomycan, oh my god, wow, I can't say it, encinomycanetes, uh, fungi, algae, protein protozoa and nematodes. I'm sorry to put that. So the species spotlight. Uh, we've already talked about bacteria, so we'll go straight into the acetomycetes. Uh, I said that wrong again. I give up. Um, gram positive bacteria, majority are aerobic. Um, that means that they require oxygen, and I'll be talking about that in a bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, you said you're not talking about bacteria, you're talking about bacteria. First of all, a light, and then second of all, it's because they mean ray fungus, kind of indirectly. And this is due to the fact that they originally thought that they were fungi, but due to the growth pattern, 
because they form Pipe, which is, you know, the little branch film, I think they're like a tree. Um, they thought they were fungi, but they're actually bacteria that look like fungi. So they confused everyone, which is pretty cool. So and aerobic and anaerobic, I touched on aerobic. So what are they? So aerobic is when they use oxygen to breathe. And then anaerobic organisms do not use oxygen. So, for example, in these test tubes, you've got their obligate aerobe, so they only breathe, they only um, at the top, they can't be at the bottom. So, if you stab it all the way through, they'll only still grow at the top. Then, this one here, if you stab it and the obligate anaerobes, they'll only grow at the bottom, they cannot handle oxygen and they're weak. So, they'll be here. And then you've got the Facultative uh, anaerobes. So these are the aerobes that are like, you know what, if you stab me in all of this, I'll grow whatever you want, but I'll prefer being up here with the oxygen, but I'll do whatever. And then you've got the air tolerant anaerobes. So they'll be like, you know what, I don't need oxygen. And even if you give me oxygen, I'm not going to use it anyway. And I'm going to live my life. So that's kind of the difference. And the reason why this is so important is because it kind of gives an indication of where they grow within the world or within an organism. Um, so, for example, if they grow on the soil surface, they might be aerobic, or if they grow really inside the soil, like deep down, they might be anaerobic. So, species spot like fungi, so there's three main types, there's yeast, moulds, and fungi. Um, and yes, I know I spelled moulds wrong, um, I spelled it the English way. So, the first one is yeast, so um, uh, they're found worldwide, they'd be common in soils and plant surfaces. Um, they require carbs, so like sugars, glucose. Um, so often found in carb-rich areas, so think things like nectar, uh, rotting fruit, um, all that good stuff, rotting foliage that we grew on there. Um, some species are pathogenic, so that means that they can induce um, infection on both animals and plants. And they can vary in shape, so some can be round, some can be long, like spaghetti. And then over here, a little fun fact, that little blob you can see is actually a yeast, like you know, baker's yeast, budding. So that's how this one does. Some of them split in half, others bud. So, like, they form a little growth and then they kind of blow up like a balloon, which is pretty cool. So, the next one is molds. So, like, the um, actinomyc seeds, uh, um, they're actually made up of hyphae and they're often found in soil. However, many molds are able to grow in areas that don't have soil. So, that's also a fun fact. Um, the spores are released. So, when they release spores, it's actually at the tips. And they travel um, through wind, rain, and or, um, other animals, or not other animals, they aren't animals. Um, yes. <laughs> so and the next one is fungi. Um, they often include mushrooms or toadstool, and the only difference between them and molds is that they simply, they're big enough that you can see them with your naked eye. You can see the fruiting body. So the fruiting body is actually the mushroom itself. All the actually fungi stuff is actually underneath. You only see the fruiting body. Um, and these are what release the spores in here. And a little fun fact is that this is fungi squared because you've got the mushroom and then you've got mold growing on the mushroom. So it's like fungi fungi. Uh, the next one is algae. So these are usually aquatic and some species grow on land. For example, there's actually terrestrial algae. Um, so if you see these like red, orangey, um, yellow patches growing on trees, those are actually terrestrial algae. Little fun fact. Um, and then you've also got lichen, which is actually this symbiote of fungi and algae growing together. So another little fun fact. Um, then the kingdom protista, and majority of them are able to photosynthesize. However, there's some algae that actually cannot photosynthesize. So, yeah. So my next question, which a lot of people get, is uh, algae plants. And the short answer is no, because plants are usually more complex. Like, for example, they've got specialized structures. So think of a plant, like they've got the stem, they've got the leaf, they might have a flower, they might have a seed and whatnot. Algae do not have any of this. Algae is basic. They have the same thing and it's just repeated over and over again. Like even kelp, even though it looks different, it's actually still the same cell. It just kind of grows in different ways. So some algae species are in fact bacteria. So for example, blue green um, algae is actually cyanobacterium. So not all algae is algae. Some are actually bacteria, a little, a little fun fact. Next one is protozoa. So this is also in the kingdom uh, protista. These are single-celled organisms and a large proportion of them are aquatic or leaving aqueous solutions. So like for example, um, water and your blood, um, as many of them are actually parasitic. So like for example, this one here is giardia. Um, and giardia is actually 
pretty fascinating in terms of it doesn't have a Golgi apparatus, which is very, 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 very uncommon in eukaryotic organisms. Um, so they're kind of a bit like unique. Uh, and they normally get around by moving through a flagellum, as you can see, these long leggy like things that actually wiggle them around and that's how they move. Uh, the next one is nematodes. So they're generally small, so less than a millimeter. Uh, they're found throughout the world in multiple habitats. And there's four main groups depending on their feeding habits. Omnivores are basically they eat anything and everything, they're not fussy. So what microorganisms would be in the habitat? And this is a question I struggle with the most because I'm trying to work out what the heck, how can I do this? And then I realized I cannot do this because it depends on where you are in the world. It depends on what is happening, um, where they found, like, you know, location, are they on the beach? Are they in the forest? Where are they? So I realized that this question is actually impossible for me to answer because it's hard for me to say. Generally, you actually find that there'll be all six groups within it, like, you know, given area, I don't know what area it would be, but there'll be probably all six groups to some description present within a given area, it's even within the beach or on the beach. Uh, for example, there is microsporum, which is the type of fungi that actually can grow on beaches and it grows in high nutrient areas, so a lot of organic. So for example, things that are washed up on the beach, you might see fungi occurring. Um, however, I can give some potential species that may be present that kind of crabs will come first. So you've got things like E. coli, which is present in many animal digestive tracts. So for example, crabs like to eat poop. So they love a good E. coli breakfast. And they're also found in a lot of waterways. We've got Staphylococcus, which is present in a lot of sand and also been isolated in water too, in beaches. We've got Vipera, which is uh, a very common aquatic uh, bacteria. And then you've got things like nematodes uh, that are also found on the beach, in the water, and on the land. So it depends on where the crabs are, that there'll be microorganisms. So what about in the crab chat? Okay, this question and a kind of a different layer of complexity because the glass box poses a whole new set of challenges. And this is due to the fact that now you're kind of containing everything, but like everything you're introducing is introducing microorganisms. So you've got the crabs, they're introducing microorganisms. Then you've got your, um, you know, things that you put inside, like, you know, your sand, your decor, um, even if you might sterilize it, there might be still bacteria present or still might be, you know, a small algae spore present that then grows, and now you've got this community thriving that you didn't even know you had. Um, then even if you, like for example, if you collect lichen and moss and you chuck it in there, that's also introducing a lot of microorganisms as well. So it ultimately boils down to what you're putting in there that leads to the development of the microbiome. So that is all I can say because it depends on who you are and where you are, because other than that, it's up there. <laughs> so the most common microbial activity within the habitat are bacterial blooms, algae, mold and mushrooms, and the creepy crawlers. And I kind of all all four of these are when you kind of notice it is when they hit plague proportions. So let's start off with the bacterial blooms. So they often refer to growth of anaerobic bacteria um, within the substrate and they're often like you know a dark gray or gray in coloration. They smell like sulfur or eggs. Um, and they usually result is due to the lack of aeration within the substrate. So due to the deep sand, it naturally, you know, decreases aeration, which is at the bottom. And then as it turns anoxic, which I'll be explaining how it happens, um, this leads to anaerobic bacteria growing in plate proportions. So why did they occur from my experience and following what other people have? The biggest culprit I found is that overwatering of some description. So water buildup can be condensation. Um, negligence. So, for example, if you spill a bit of water or, you know, the pool break for whatever reason, you've got a bit more water in there, that can happen. Um, I'm trying to think right now, and I'm coming up blank, and then blank, something else that does water. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, I hit off there. Yeah, cool. <laughs> So, um, and then you've got, for example, the size of substrates, so the grain size would impact circulation. So, for example, the more finer the grain, the more readily it is to compact compared to a really chunky grain, it allows that oxygen to diffuse through. So, finer grains more likely to lead to anaerobic conditions. And then you've just got chance. So, perhaps, you know, you've got a bit of food in there and it got buried, and now you've got a beautiful, rich food source for bacteria to grow. 
Now you go to back to your glue. So generally, what to do? So remove all the substrate that's affected, that's discolored, is white. Start it ASAP, and also immediately around it. Just because the substrate around it is in discolored doesn't mean that it doesn't have um, anaerobic bacteria. If you want to get rid of it, you're going to have to kind of get more out just to make sure because it might be growing there, but it might not hit a play portions that it, you see the color change. And then also in the process, you're going to try and work out why it developed and see if there's anything you could do to minimize it. So if, you, for example, you've been misting for whatever reason, minimize the amount of water you're misting and then, you know, things like that, condensation, you know, tend to have a tank or, you know, wipe it down, be, you know, on top of things and you're good to go. I will briefly talk about um, false bottoms because I know a lot of people like false bottoms and um, in theory they work great. However, in practice, not really. And that's just due to the way that water works. So when, um, if you if it's water saturation, the substrate actually holds the bulk of the water until it literally hits over saturation and that's when it drips out. And that's called like the water table or the water perch. And so when that happens, you already hit like potential anaerobic conditions or a bacterial bloom. So uh, false bottom is good if you've spilled a lot of water, but by then you're going to have a lot of water within the substrate as is. So I find it kind of pointless. Um, I know that some people love it and they do them, but for me, um, the way that they work isn't really applicable in our setups. So uh, sponges as well is another big topic. So most of us choose not to have sponges because they can um, be known for being a bad bacteria magnet. Um, I feel like a lot of this is kind of just built up um, hype in a way. Um, I'm not an endorser for sponges, by the way. I will just say this now. I dislike sponges with a passion, but think of the sponge similar to the substrate. So for example, oxygen diffusion is greater on the surface of the sponge than it is on the inside. So the inside's more likely to develop anaerobic conditions than outside. Um, if you're, you know, maintaining a sponge, then technically it can work, and it's no different. For example, there are no rock or pebbles. If you wash your, you know, gravel, if you have gravel within your bowl, or you know, marbles or glass, that also will uh, grow bacteria too. So, you know, not all bacteria is bad. Um, I just want to get that point across. Not all bacteria is bad, and bad bacteria is only what you perceive as bad. Um, so it depends on the person. The next one is algae blooms. So algae blooms is basically what you think it would be. It's algae that blooms within the substrate, or often it can be within the pools if your pools are large enough. Um, they, it often requires good lighting and organics to thrive and moisture as well. So if it grows within the substrate, um, it's not harmful. It may be ugly to look at, but the only thing is it might suggest that your substrate might be a bit too moist. So it'd be worth doing like, you know, the chopstick, the knife, or um, what are the, the ruler method, you know, all three where you stick something in there and see if there's any water build up and then go from there. Um, otherwise, it's not harmful, it just looks kind of yucky. But other than that, it's fine. Um, and then you've got fungal outbreaks. So fungi is when like fungi like, you know, mold or, you know, mushrooms grow. Um, they're often due to the lack of circulation within the tank, so stay aware, coupled with high organics and excessive moisture. Many aren't harmful, just like many are, um, especially if consumed. So if you're not sure, which many of us aren't sure what type of fungi we've got, if we do have fungi, it's best to just remove it just in case because you don't know if it's actually toxic or not. It might not be, it might be. Um, when handling, I just want to say um, extreme caution is necessary, um, as particularly mushrooms, if you, you know you move it around a lot, you're releasing a lot of spores. So if you're, you know, shaking it around within the tank or whatever, if you're releasing spores within the tank, so it means you've removed one and you now probably have like hundreds of spores and potential new uh, mushrooms to develop. So be extra vigilant with how you remove it. And once it's out of the tank, also be vigilant because you don't want those spores to go all over your house too. So the next one is, how does it happen? So be vigilant with food. So, you know, if you see food, fresh foods that you're dragged around or whatever, remove it. Um, that is basically, it's food, take away the food, you're taking away a lot of the problem. Um, another thing to do is increase air circulation. And I know it might seem kind of intuitive, but while allowing the tank to breathe is allowing things to dry out. Remember, it requires moisture um, 
to to move our so as you allow to breathe, you're allowing moisture, particularly from surfaces, to evaporate, which decreases fungi from developing. Another great way is to use salt, so boil things in heavily salted water, allow it to air dry, and then pop it back in the tank. Salt is great at um, curbing uh, fungal outbreaks. So not all fungi are salt sensitive, some aren't, but majority are. So creepy callers. So what are they? They're often nematodes, but they can include things like springtail and mites. They're all attracted to the warm, humid, and the food-rich habitat. Uh, many of them are actually found within your home naturally or within, you know, outside your home even, and you track it in. And so removal or, or elimination is basically pointless because in a couple of months' time, you're going to, not even a couple of months, like a couple of weeks, you're going to have them all back in again, so you're going to have to do the same thing again. Um, Think of them as a good like vacuum for your tank because a lot of them actually, you know, eat mold, eat fungi spores, uh, eat bacteria, uh, eat wasted food. So they can be good for that. Um, this little diagram here is actually going to be part of the parasitology, and I'm giving you guys a quick sneak peek of what to expect. A little heads up. So now the crab biome itself. So this is the fun part. Um, by the way, this little image is actually not looking at a crab biome. This is for one of my subjects where we looked at antibiotic resistance, but I thought this would be cool, so I included it. Um, so the crab exterior, so remember, it has an exoskeleton except for its abdomen, and it's mostly comprised of chitin, which, funny enough, is actually what is fungi mostly comprised of, and it offers similar protection to our skin. Um, the exoskeleton is like their skin of what our skin is to us, and believe it or not, our skin has bacteria. I know you're going to love this one. Um, it's also important to eat your calcium, so that's why I included this image. Um, so I'm currently covered in bacteria right now. And I know you might be going, ew, that's yuck. But these bacteria are great in utilizing nutrients on your skin and also help with human health. So they also help reduce chances of infection. And they generally keep your skin happy and healthy. So support your bacteria. Um, now, the normal body and uh, flora study. So this looked at native shell and body flora of active hermit crabs in three populations. And they compared um, the cultures between the three populations and see if there was any difference. Um, there was. There was actually and that good minute difference, which also kind of ties in with the, what will be present within your habitat. And that basically is like, it depends on where it's from. Um, and then they also compare cultures and they looked at a probiotic spray that was marketed towards hermit crabs and see if the probiotic spray had any effect on the hermit crabs uh, microbiome. Um, the one that they used was all living things from a crab probiotic spray, which I believe is only sold in PetSmart, and I don't think it's sold anymore because I can't find any PetSmart thingy in bubbles. Like, I can't see it on the website, but I don't know. I'm Aussie. Um, so, now, what's the ingredient list of this really, really good uh, probiotic spray? Uh, so, it's purified water, fair enough. You know, you know, distilled, it's good enough. Easy source, natural enzymes, which is that like, cool. What is a natural enzyme? Anything's a natural enzyme. You could chuck like, Bob Larry Joe in there, and it's now natural enzymes. So sweet. Um, we love the complexity of this formula. And then we looked at the beneficial bacteria. So this is also really great, really sweet, uh, very complex. Uh, basically, you can throw some jet outside. It's got bene beneficial bacteria. And now you call it a probiotic spray and charge it around and absorb it out. So good on you. Uh, so what was actually in the bottle? So thankfully, the researchers actually did the hard work and actually found out what was in the bottle. So thanks to them, found out they're all gram-positive bacteria. They're all rod-shaped and spore-forming. So spores are actually resistant to a lot of um, environmental damages. So things like UV, heat, um, extreme cold, uh, even pH and whatnot. So spores allow bacteria, if the bacteria dies, it allows the species to survive as the spore will kind of germinate again, think of it like a seed, um, if when conditions are right. So the two species are actually Bacillus species, and they're Bacillus pumilus and Bacillus lachniformis. So species spotlight like pumilus. So these are commonly found in our soil, and they are known to form spores, which I already mentioned, oh, what is a spore? Uh, 
They're actually commonly used in uh, lab for lab work, and they also use in industrial and commercial purposes. Like for example, in agriculture, they use one uh, strain of pumulus to actually be a natural fungicide because it actually um, prevents fungal spores from developing. So, a little fun fact: uh, pumulus is, you know, kind of the cool boy in agriculture. And then you've got lactoniformis, which is commonly found in soils, and is also, uh, funny enough, found on bird feathers and reptile skin. And this is due to the ability to degrade beta keratin, which is present on bird feathers and reptile skin. Remember that birds and reptiles are closely related, so they're likely to have similar um, proteins on or, on or in their bodies. Um, and these are also commonly grown in lab, and they can be used for industrial or commercial purposes. Like, for example, these guys are used, or a product of these are a protease, which breaks up enzyme, is actually used in laundry detergent or in a lot of laundry detergents. So when you're washing your laundry, you think that you're using a bacteria protein to wash your laundry. You'd be loving that. Uh, so the phylogenetic uh, tree, so over here we've got the soil, so I'm going to be looking over here. Uh, the soil, so these are the two species that we've got. Then you've also got aquatic species, so you'll probably see this in like, you know, marine or freshwater environments. Then you've got the things like, you know, that cause a lot of diseases, so that's still serious, so that causes a lot of diseases in humans. Um, and then you've got the other boys and girls that aren't important. <laughs> so why would these bacteria species threaten? This is entirely speculation, so they you know, I'm not saying that the company did it because of this, I'm just saying what I think the company did. It's easy to source, it grows in large numbers, it's easy to grow in lab, very easy to grow, you literally just like whack it on gel for a day, um, or in a bottle. It's commonly found like everywhere. Um, and it's found in soil, so the spray is marketed towards probiotic for tank. Uh, tank has soil in it, so spray it, and now your tank soil is beautiful, surprisingly. Um, it is also extensively studied and generally beneficial to the environment because it has a lot of beneficial traits that we desire. Um, so that's probably why they put it in there, but I'm not the company. So from the crabs themselves, these are the species that were isolated. So you got Bacillus. I suspected, so they weren't entirely sure that it was bacillus, that it had bacillus like traits, but it wasn't entirely bacillus. And then you got Sphingomonas, um, Porcifer uh, mobilis, then you got bacillus uh, species one and two, uh, then you got Staphylococcus uh, zalosus, zalos, and then you got Pseudonomus species, Enterobacter species, Aeronomus species, uh, Acidobacter wolfii. And gram positive cocci uh, bacteria, and then unknown yeast. And the last two is basically they couldn't find anything that really matched them well, so they kind of just popped in there. So, species spotlight we've already kind of talked about the first couple, so we're going to go straight into Sphingomonas. So, this is a gram negative bacteria, it's aerobic, however, it can um, grow in slightly anaerobic uh, conditions. Um, and interestingly, interestingly enough, um, due to it being rod shaped, a lot of bacilli are actually gram positive. So, rod shaped bacteria are gram positive, except these bad boys. They have to be unique, like everything in bio. Um, back to, these bacteria are motile, so they're able to move in a broth, hence its name, um, Mobilis, because it can move around. Um, it's very uncommon um, pathology in, in humans. However, it can be pretty common with uh, bone infection, so um, osteomyelitis or septic uh, arthritis. So it can be pretty damaging, but it's not too bad. It can be treatable. Next is Pseudomonas. So this is kind of my firm favorite of bacteria. I love Pseudomonas. Um, they're really cool because they are well known within the medical and microbiological uh, communities. Um, this is due to the wide range of uh, species and many uh, um, opportunist opportunistic pathologens with humans and also plants. Um, they're also easy to culture in lab. Um, Genome is extensively studied. They're commonly found in soil and water. They're gram negative, uh, rod shaped, they're aerobic, and they and some species like their uh, Pseudonomus aerogulosa is actually capable of forming a biofilm. So biofilms are basically what protect the bacteria from antimicrobial agents. So this is how they kind of evade their immune system. Next, you've got the Staphylococcus. So this is gram positive. Um, cockeyed, so it's round and it's faculty of anaerobes, so it does best in aerobic conditions, but can also handle anaerobic. It is found on animal skin and it's also found within the environment and is one of the known pathogenic um, 
bovine mastocytis, so inflammation of the mammillary glands or the udders of cows. Um, they're known to be present in a lot of dairy. Um, so yum, cheese, next time you're eating cheese, think of beautiful staphylococcus. And then used to cure some ham and sausages as well. So they're used in a lot of food, unknowingly. And then you've got Enterobacter species. So this is a um, granulative facultative anaerobe and they rod shaped. They're commonly found in soil and water and they're also found in gastrointestinal tract of us and mammals uh, and also plants. Some species are known to be pathogenic and many are motile and they're able to move around. So next you go, um, aeromomas. So these are gram-negative faculty of anaerobes and rod shapes in which are uh, enterobacter, but they differ due to being oxidase positive. So when it has an oxidase test, they look like the bubble and fizz, and that's just due to the fact that it has a cytochrome C oxidase, which is useful with respiration. So that's the reason why they're different from enterobacter. They found normally within water, either marine or fresh, and they're thought to be closely related to vibrio. However, they actually now found out that they kind of form their own distinct lineage once they analyze their genes. So the next one is the Centobacter wolfii. So these are gram-negative rod-shaped aerobic bacteria, commonly found on the skin or within soil, and also within a quarter of the human population found within the orthotics as well. So kind of interesting. They're pretty opportunistic pathogen, um, but pathogen, but they're not really much of a problem. And then found within a lot of food as well. And that's just due to the fact that they're resistant to a lot of temperatures and they're extremely resilient. And then the final thing is general trends. So you may notice that a lot of these are commonly found in soil and water, which makes sense because it's on the outside of the crab. They have a lot of contact with both soil and water. Um, they're aerobic, so at most of that. Uh, faculty of anaerobes because remember they're going to be using oxygen for respiration it makes no sense to have an anaerobe um and a lot of anaerobes wouldn't do well with exposure to oxygen but all of them are pretty resilient and most species are extremely pathogenic which is very common even with our own skin biome um they can be pathogenic and that's just due to how they grow so next to hemocrag gut so this is kind of divided into three parts and I'm going to zoom in my eyes. So you've got the full gut. So this is kind of like their stomach. So this is where it breaks down. So it uses a lot of enzymic and acid activity to break down food after they've been chewing it and breaking the part of the hinges. And you've got the mid gut, which is kind of very similar to our uh, small intestines. I forgot what that was again. Um, and then you've got the hind gut, which is kind of similar to our large intestine. So this is where bulk of nutrients is kind of being uh, removed, mostly in the mid gut, but also within the hind gut as well. Um, then the heptopancreatic, uh, uh wow, I stuck that up twice. Heptopancreatic, wow, you know what, I'm doing great. Um, that's where a lot of nutrients are stored, believe it or not. So a little fun fact. You may notice that our biology is kind of similar. And so this is why I'm going to be talking about our biology right now. So our gut is filled with microorganisms, in particular bacteria. So this aids you with digestion and absorption of nutrients. Without bacteria within our gut, we would not be able to absorb as much nutrients as we could. So the food intake greatly influences the what type of microorganisms grow within the gut. So, for example, plant-based foods require more energy um, because they need to break down a cell wall, which is very thick and very hard to break down compared to animals. And then remember that different food groups contain different nutrients. So, for example, a seed will contain different nutrients to a leaf, which will contain different nutrients to a flower, et cetera, et cetera. And they'll have different concentrations of nutrients and digestibility as well, so how easy it is to break down. So the gut biome within us, within our crab. So one article actually looked at the gut biome within wild and captive uh, hemocrabs. So it looked at um, Cenobita pilatus and Cenobita uh, rogosus, uh, which is both were in Indonesia. So if I butcher these Indonesian uh, uh, towns, I'm sorry, I haven't done Indonesian in a while. So probably when you're watching this, Salamat uh, Salama Malam, and that's about it. <laughs> but So uh, it was uh, conducted in Teluk uh, Telak uh, Nias, which is uh, present in uh, Sumatra, so that's on the left. And then the second site was in 
Pirangian uh, Bantan, which is present on the island of uh, Java. And they found that the wild and the captive uh, crabs, they looked at comparisons between not only each population within the wild, but they looked at the wild populations to captive populations as well. Um, this was conducted with uh, PCR. So they looked at, they extracted all the um, microorganisms and then used PCR to amplify DNA. And then they were able to synthesize, well, analyze the DNA and then match it with known data. So the results between the species. So they found that they actually, the straws actually have the highest amount of species, over 5,000 species were found within the gut, while the ruggies only had around about 50 species found. Um, this proportionate um, between the two species could be due to a number of issues, but the authors actually suggested this was due to difference in habitat preference. So they, they state that the strawberries they tend to live on or by the coast, which a lot of us are familiar with, and while ruggies are known to make trips inland, so they tend to, you know, be more present with vegetative matter compared to straws. So maybe, maybe not, I'm not 100% sure. Um, it'd be interesting to see this repeated and see if it had the same thing, because I wonder if it might be issues with PCR, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, interestingly, that latest actually had these three groupings, so they had the rotobacteriales, um, the bacterial Bacterioides and the Vibrio species. So let's go through species spotlight. So this is from the class Alpha Proteobacteria. Um, these are gram negative, usually rod or rod like in shape. They're mobile and the majority are found in aquatic areas. However, some are found terrestrial and they're actually known to be present within a lot of guts of anthropods, so like crustaceans, spiders, and scorpions. So this one was not really, I guess, a surprise when you kind of look at it, but Good to know. <laughs> Next one is the bacterial days, which are also known as that, which I'm not going to even bother pronouncing because my eyes are going cross-eyed. Um, they're gram negative and a lot of cultured in lab actually rod, rod yeah. shape, but there is also cockeyed shapes so around shape. Um, minority are halophilic or halotolerant, so that means they can actually withstand growing in salt or salty like conditions. Um, it just depends on the species. Some can handle salt more than others. Um, and then the next one is Vibrio. So this is gram negative and is kind of known for the interesting squiggly shape. So if you look, you can see how he's got like little squiggles. And that is Vibrio working its charm. Um, it's mobile, it's aquatic, it's halo tolerant. So it's actually found in a lot of marine areas and is pretty pathogenic, um, not only to us, but also to a lot of shrimp as well. Um, but uh, they're actually really cool. I think they're interesting. So then the ruggies, they had uncultured bacteria, so they were not in gene databases. Then they had Rotospira CA, and then they also had genuses from the Hellomonas, the Cytophaga, and the Pseudonomus. So the Roto, so as the name kind of suggests, they're kind of got a spiral shape. This one here, this species here is actually able to look at magnetic fields, so it can actually orientate themselves from magnetic fields. Um, they're ground negative, typically anaerobic, and they actually can photosynthesize, which I always find hilarious. Um, one genus is able to sense magnetic field, which is that one pictured, and they're found in soils in close associate with plants. So they're generally uh, found next to plants. The next one is a halomona, so these are ground negative uh, they're curved rods. They can be bacilli or cockeye, depending on species and also strain. They're motile, so they're able to move. So those little projections that you see is actually their flagella, and that's how they kind of move around, they kick them around. Um, they're halophilic, and they can be found in marine environments. And then next, we've got the cytophaga. So these are close relation to the um, bacteroids, which I mentioned prior. They're gram negative, rod shaped. Many are obligate anaerobes and found within soil or aquatic environments. And they're non pathogenic in a lot of cases. So, this one here, they actually kind of move by creeping along. So, that's what all these little projections are. They actually like kind of like scoot along, which I find really funny. But yeah. Um, so, trends in gut biome, you may notice that both uh, share species from the alpha and gamma uh, proteobacteria classes. 
many um, contain microbes that are halophilic and halotolerant, which makes sense because they tend to be living in or near um, saline-like conditions or drink saline-like saline -like water. If you're thinking of straws, uh, they'd be known to drink just straight salt water no ish. Um, then they have high proportions of um, facultative anaerobes or aerobic gram-negative bacteria, which gram-negative bacteria tend to be a bit more resilient and um, facultative anaerobes or anaerobes in general will work better in the gut as it will be typically oxygen devoid. So due to the large distances in collection sites, I feel like the one key aspect of this article that I failed to mention is just is this separation does separation lead to differences in microbial diversity because they're literally two different islands a good couple of 200 kilometers miles apart um if the collection sites were closer or within the same beach would the microbial diversity be as drastic as it was and that's what i would love if they did a follow-up on that so they also looked at captive hermit crabs. So they looked at recently deceased or dying um, straws, and they actually found that they had decreased levels of biodiversity. And all of this highlighted in particular was they had less vibrio species, which is kind of interesting because they're known to be pathogenic species within shrimp. However, healthy ruggies showed very similar distribution of micro microbial diversity to the wild counterparts. However, the wild species had high levels. So they had similar, like, think of it like a bell shaped curve, so the wild species were like bigger. And just they mentioned that part of the issue is just due to diet, because in the wild they might be exposed to a lot more foods than they are in captivity, which then brings on to the diet and interaction of the gut. So lack of studies looking at diet of wild populations is kind of the big key issue, I feel. Um, few and far between, like there's Hardly, if anything, um, a lot of it is just speculation or what they perceive because they know that they're scavengers. However, diet and health go hand in hand. Um, a, a good diet is a healthy crab. And should captive individuals suffer from the lack of gut diversity? So if they don't have an extensive diet, would that mean that they will suffer for that? Um, bacteria is actually critical for good gut health. So it plays a role in digestion, food processing, health in general, immune function. So potentially, would this give us the opportunity, maybe in the future, to look at emicrab oriented probiotic food, which helps support gut diversity and gut health, which maybe will increase our captive species lifespan. So the final part is the parasites and the pathogens, and this is a really fun part, I think, as everything else. So what is a parasite? So according to the CDC, a parasite is an organism that lives on or in a host organism and gets its food from or at the expense of the host. Um, and a lot of times, the uh, pathogen is actually a different species. However, there is one exception that I could find, and that is that so one species of um, not mushroom, jellyfish, well, I'm doing brain, uh, is actually, the young actually grow inside the mother, take up all the nutrients out of it, literally, like drink it all up, and then once they do that, they move off and find some other jellyfish and do the same thing and just repeat the cycle. So not everything is like clean cut in biology, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> Um, as you can imagine, parasites are kind of everywhere and anywhere, um, wherever they are, wherever you are, there are going to be parasites. And interestingly enough, chemicals actually do have parasites. Um, and unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot of research done on chemical parasites from what I could find. But in general, as a chemical group, talking about both terrestrial and aquatic, they are quite numerous, often more than what you would think. For example, a parasite includes viruses, worms, mites, and protists, and also bacteria. So this is present, th these are present within hermit crabs. Um, and you may be going, how? Um, so for example, viruses like a, um, oh yeah, here we go. Sorry, I lost my, I lost my train of thought. They do, all these that I mentioned, and including barnacles from marine ones, isopods also from marine ones, um, and fungi as well. 
which I find very interesting. So, virus. So, only a small handful have been found on or within the land hammer crabs. And unfortunately, only one virus I could see, which was a very high hammer crab virus spore published in Nature by Xi in 2016, yes, um, found a hammer crab only virus or hammer crab virus. However, the way it was collected from, it was in southern China, which is warm enough that there can be a cap, oh, not captive, wild populations of hem land hammer crabs. So it's unsure of whether the hammer crab that he got it from was actually aquatic or terrestrial. And it would be interesting if he could go back and, or if he's got the tissue sample, which I feel like he would or should, if he can analyze that and see if it's in fact terrestrial, if he's unsure. Because it'd be really interesting to be like, this is the first land hammer crab virus that's been published. Um, but besides that parasite, let's look at others. So they're known that a lot of viruses that infect um, other crabs. So for example, you've got the mud crab uh, rear virus and then you've got irrigator virus that infect like things like isopods, which have the potential to infect our homies because just to being close related. However, there has been no reports of it being like transmitted to our homies, but doesn't mean it doesn't because it can also be transmitted through cannibalism, uh, parasitic nematodes, and endoparasitic wasps, according to virus taxonomy in 2012. Um, interestingly, that out of 149 parasite species of hammer crabs, only roughly like like a small handful, like 10 max, are present within crabs. Um, so they include a nematode, which was present in uh, uh, Scabola, um, so the Israeli and hermit crab. Um, then you've got a lot of mites, which in a vast majority of cases, they were unable to determine 100% if the mite was in fact beneficial or if it was just an actual parasite, um, they needed further studies to actually investigate kind of the relationship between the two. Um, so are mites harmful? Like if you see mites in your crab, are they harmful? And the general thing is no. Most of them are actually detrimental, so they're actually going to be your cleanup crew, as I kind of mentioned prior with the fungi and the fungi spores and the bacteria. So most of them are actually doing you a favor. And the only time you panic is if you see something on the crab itself, particularly between like leg segments or like, you know, where the legs attach to the body, then you might be like, mm, something's up. And that's when you might want to treat. Um, otherwise, within the crab habitat itself, just think of them as a good cleanup crew. And just, you know, when you've got pets in, you can watch your pet mice play around. So, hemocrabs is a vector. So, a vector is what is basically it carries a virus or an organism or a parasite from one individual to another. So for example, the endoplasmic wasp carries the a virus from one individual to another. And believe it or not, there's actually some evidence to support that hermocrabs, our hermocrabs, a lot of hermocrabs are actually vectors uh, for a lot of mammalian uh, diseases. Um, and this is just due to the fact that they're then eating fecal matter um, and the exorcists from nematodes, tapeworms and amoeba are viable once they actually pass through the crab and they actually grow, which means, may lead to development of parasites in other individuals. So basically what I'm trying to say is after you handle your crabs, please wash your hands, like especially wash your hands and especially if you feed um, like fecal matter to your crabs, it's important to wash your hands. Be proactive. <laughs> So final thoughts. Now, what we went through today was environmental microorganisms. So your tank has a lot, and just like the um, environment itself has a lot, what, what it has in there ultimately ends up to what your tank is. The crab itself has an extensive microbiome, both internally and externally, and that honestly keeps the crab happy and healthy. And will that potentially allow paving way for potential products marketed towards to help improve microbiome within captive individuals and increase or decrease chances of, of death within captive individuals. 
And then finally, we looked at parasites and pathogens. So pathogens are bacteria and a lot of uh, ways that crabs kind of, you know, deal with them or in their day-to-day -day life. I really hope you enjoyed this talk and thank you to the whole bunch um, for listening. Thank you to Mary and Stacey. And also I want to give a big shout out to the images that I utilize. Um, thank you them too. Goodbye.